This lecture is part of an effort to get done with a book. Uh, I was asked to write a textbook, and we have, what, four chapters left out of how many? Sixteen? Yes. So we're, we're, we're closing in. So you, I'm, I'm hoping this will help me. I hope it'll help you. Uh, energy economics is not generally covered in most schools of foreign affairs, and I find that to be not good. And it's not good because, first of all, you're supposed to get an education so you could read the newspaper, and this stuff is in the newspaper. So the first point would be you'd want to know something about energy economics just to know what's going on day to day. I think. Beyond that, the capital investment associated with electrical generation in particular and uh, the fuel distribution systems frequently is so great it involves governments, either in a regulatory fashion or subsidies or actual capital outlay. So you can't really understand what governments are doing and how sound their decisions are unless you know something about it energy economics. Now, um, I am not an expert. I am an amateur, uh, as in the word amateur lover. I like this stuff, okay? It's not that I've taken economics. I just read. My interest in this is based on a simple point. I teach a course on the spread of nuclear weapons, both in the superpowers and other countries. One of the big debating points amongst less developed countries, uh, with countries that have nuclear power technology, is that they have a right to peaceful nuclear energy. Now, it's not clear whether it's peaceful, but if you ask some countries, they will say, well, everything you need to get right up to having a bomb I want an enrichment plan so I can enrich uranium, even though that will allow me within hours to have enough material highly enriched to make a nuclear weapon. Or I would like to separate plutonium from spent fuel, even though, again, that would allow you in a short period of time to get the material needed to make a bomb. Now, uh, it doesn't help that those kinds of facilities, enrichment plants and processing plants, are very, very difficult to keep tabs on. By the time you find out something has gone on in the way of a military diversion, it's probably too late. Uh, in other words, the amount of time between detecting a diversion and the amount of time it takes to convert that material into a bomb is, is so short. Uh, that you may miss it and only be able to detect it after it happens, and maybe even after a bomb's been made. That's a little different than other parts of uh, the nuclear fuel cycle. Now, simple proposition one, if nuclear power becomes extremely popular, as in economical, uh, to the taste of many nations, there will be a lot of nuclear power and when there are a lot of nuclear power plants, there will be a demand as well for these other activities, even if they're not that economical. So, roughly, if we see nuclear power spread, there's a good reason to believe the number of countries that will have, uh, as one wag put it, bomb starter kits will go up. If they insist they have a right to something, well, that will only make it more likely. Now, here's the catch. I have never heard of someone insist on the right to something that loses money. Generally, people insist on the right to do something that they think they're going to benefit from. To give an example, in the 60s, people insisted on the right to test peaceful nuclear explosives. 
We now have since learned that when you make a hole in the ground for peaceful purposes with a nuclear explosive, there's so much radiological debris, cleaning it up makes it very uneconomical to start in the first place. As a result, nobody insists on that anymore. So, we want to know what's economical for that reason as well. Let's get started. Okay, so what are the questions we're going to cover? The first one we just covered. Why bother with energy economics? The second question is, what are the basics of electrical production, consumption, distribution, and storage? I'm going to add one, because it's in the news. Resilience. You've heard this, perhaps. If not, you'll be full of knowledge about it before you leave. And then, how do nuclear and non-nuclear forms of energy perform at home and abroad? Okay. Some of these things are recognizable. The house, the power plant, cooling tower, the power poles. Some of the other things you might maybe have seen as well. Transmission lines and towers, and maybe you've even seen a transformer. How does this work? Your basic electrical grid starts essentially with the generation of electricity at the power plant. More often than not, what you're doing is trying to get something to spin. Why? To get voltage, essentially, you're trying to create a magnetic field and pushing the production of voltage through wires. So you need something to spin. Coal-fired plants, gas-fired nuclear power plants, all boil water to produce steam to spin a turbine to get rotation. You have that rotation, you can then produce voltage. The first thing that happens after you have voltage is you have to transmit it. And you use high voltage first to try to get the voltage out as far as possible. If you use low voltage, it won't go very far. Essentially, you have to get uh, enough voltage to other transformers so that you can keep moving this electricity to the user. The transformer will take alternating current, and we'll get into what alternating current is. That's the most popular form of electricity. And it increases the voltage at certain points where it's declined to the point where it needs to be bumped up. The power lines are the last part of the, uh, the equation, and usually you have a transformer, a little drum, you may see this if you look out your window, to reduce the voltage to something your fuses can deal with in your home. Now, that's a rough overview. Um, let's think about the stability of this grid. You've perhaps heard this point, you know, grid stability. Any of you uh, ever blown a fuse at home? No, just two of you? Where are you guys living? In tents? Come on. All right. How did it happen? Well, too many things in the same outlet. Very good. So you drew more current than was coming in. Anybody else have a different story? Put something in my pocket I wasn't supposed to. Well, any of you experience a lightning storm and while well, lights went out? There's not. Okay. Also, if you get a surge and there's more voltage going into the system than, you, than it's designed for, you will blow a fuse. So it's just got to be kind of like the Goldilocks proposition. It's got to be just the right amount, not too much and not too little. One of the reasons you have transformers to up the voltage and bring it down is to make sure that when it gets to your house, it can be handled by the electrical fuse system you've got. Um, I think the other thing to keep in mind when you look at this picture is what it costs to do that balancing. Now, 
I don't see any plugs here. Oh, there's one. Can someone tell me um, if you were going to pay the bill for the electricity for this event, what percentage of the bill would be for the generation of the electricity that pushes the voltage through all those wires? Any guesses? Oh, come on. The whole point of going to school is to make mistakes. Actually, if you don't make mistakes, there's no point. 30 percent. How much? 30. Yes, you're, you're very good. Because that actually roughly is the figure. Most politicians, if you had election certificates, you'd say 70%, more often than not. That's the reason we always debate, well, what kind of energy are you in favor of? Okay. But because you're right, that means that the generation of power, while important, is not everything. And in fact, with regard to the, what they're billing you for, the management of this system to make sure that there's not too much or too little actually is the lion's share of what you're paying for. Most people don't know that. And that has enormous consequences in understanding the rest of this briefing. Okay. Um, there are other forms of electricity that can be put on those wires that don't involve spinning. Solar. Well, now hydro does spin. You have hydro turbines. Um, wind spins. And you'll even uh, know that there's a frequency associated with the electrical system. And different electrical systems in different countries will have sometimes different frequencies. So you carry converters, right, when you travel. That's why they're operating at a different speed of that turning shaft. OK. All right, a word on alternating and direct current. Um, direct current is pretty easy to explain. It's voltage, like water, moving in a single single direction. There you have it. You push electrons down a wire towards its objective. Alternating current, a little more complicated. It's like an oscillation. The electrons move forward and back, forward and back, so that you get, it's like a pulse. And you can see, I wonder if this thing I'm not going to try. But you can see in the bottom uh, graphic the difference between direct current. It's directional, and it keeps going. You push the electrons through the wire, in a sense. Whereas alternating current goes back and forth. You get a pulse. That's important. And you can see the alternating current. Remember I said the frequency associated with the rotation of the wires or windings around the magnet? You get, a, you get a sine wave, and that's roughly measures the movement back and forth of that alternating current. That becomes important to understand what an alternating current transformer does. At a certain point, oops, those wires lose some of the electricity. Distance. A certain percentage, 10 percent sometimes is used as the figure. It depends on the technology. So you go and you use a transformer. The input comes in with a winding of six, and the output is a winding of five, excuse me, five and ten turns. When when you have this windings, uh, you don't absolutely need a, a a soft iron core, but, but, but an alternator, original alternator design, I believe, had, had this. You are able to double the voltage at the transformer, and so you're able to up it again. So the game is to get the voltage to that transformer drum and into your house at that voltage that it can cope with, and not to lose so much of it that you can't use the electricity to, to make your appliances work. All right? Now, uh, a word on direct current. Direct current was what uh, Mr. Edison was very enamored of. And he lost to Mr. Westinghouse. However, he's coming back. And the reason he's coming back is 
Originally, the reason direct current was not seen as a winner was, if you go back to this, there was a problem that you wanted to use uh, alternating current for your appliances. And the first problem is you'd have to convert the direct current into alternating current. And they had ways of doing it. It was really expensive. Then there was initially, in the old days, a lot of loss in the trans transforming, or I mean, I should say the transmission of the electricity. Now that's not the case. I mean, if you take a look at some of these uh, lines, uh, if you take a look, it, you can see the green line from essentially the northern border of Washington and Oregon dropping down to the border between Arizona and Nevada. That's a long distance. Uh, you can see some of the other lines that go from Canada down into uh, the Northeast. There are short ones in the case of the red things here in the case of Europe. What's happening is not only is it possible to move uh, direct current without losing very much of the current, but they now, with com the computational uh, advances and solid state technology, have been able to figure out how to convert direct current into alternating current inexpensively. So one of the things you may start to see is more direct current lines. It's not for nothing when we take a look at the map of China later in this brief. They have big plans for a lot of direct current lines. And the reason why uh, we'll, we'll get to is resilience, the ability uh, to have a more elegant, simpler system. Stated simply, with direct current, you don't depend so much on the transformers, and you don't have that as a failure point. All right, All right a word on base and peak load. Today, it is 98 degrees. We're inside. There's air conditioning. Okay, what time of day is it? Well, it's... Oh, okay, let's go to summer. Essentially, it's somewhere between... Uh, well, it's near the peak. It's around, you know, that, that peak starts at around 11 o'clock and goes to about 4 o'clock. Okay, so that's where we are. We're, we're in that hump on the summer chart B on the time of day. Well, why does it come down? Why does it come down? What happens after 4 o'clock? Sun goes down. Well, it gets a little cooler. What else? Office is closed. Office, and you go home. You turn on the air conditioner in your car. You go home. And then when you get home, it's cooler. You use less electricity, and the factories aren't working. In most countries, consumption by uh, manufacturing can be up to 50% or more of the electricity. They frequently turn off at 5. Okay, why is it very little in the morning? You're asleep. I gotta wake up. All right, in the winter, essentially, what we have is at the beginning of the day, you're asleep. That's your base. Then you wake up and you start drinking coffee, you plug that in, you dry your hair if you got long hair, uh, you listen to the radio, whatever. Then you go to work. They turn on the lights, they turn on the machinery. And then what happens? Why is there a valley in the middle? This is the most important labor institution in human history. It's called lunch. They have lunch. Everybody leaves the office. They come back. Up it goes again, and then it goes down. Now, why is that important? Why, why am I spending all this time just telling you about peak. It's because what you need to supply peak demand is different than what is the bare minimum amount you need to supply or the base 24-7. We'll get into this right now. Okay, base load generators, coal, big coal plants, big hydro plants, big nuclear plants, big natural gas plants. 
Now, the number you need, even for base load, is more than what your demand is for base. Why? Well, the coal plants need cleaning. The hydro plants get, I don't know, algae in the, in, the, in the ports. They have to clean them occasionally. Even natural gas plants have to be serviced. The nuclear power plants, every roughly 18 months, you've got to shut them down. Most designs are called light water reactors. You've got to shut them down for a week to, to, to four, depending on how good your service contract is, to refuel them. So you need several more than the bare minimum to meet your base load capacity demand. Okay, the peak load generators generally are much smaller and they're more numerous. Uh, they use natural gas, diesel, and propane principally. And these plants, they, 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 they talk about them being uh, in spinning reserve. And that's code for, well, you got to keep them running kind of like keeping your engine on idle. You know? If you, if you want to make sure that you can leave at any time, you know, like in a getaway car, for your 7-Eleven robbery that you're planning for, for later tonight, you don't depend on the engine to turn over. You keep it on idle. Then when you need to ramp up and get away, that's exactly what these plants do. So you have spinning reserve, you have many of these plants, because these things break down quite a lot. All right? So you can imagine lots of... You know, when someone says, well, we need X number of gigawatts electrical, well, you need even much, much more to have the peak load spinning reserve and the service considerations for the base load and the service considerations for the peak load. Okay. Now, I said we would talk about current events a little. Big issue right now is, well, we got to save the coal and nuclear now, you know, depending on your political outlook, there are various motives. Let's not get into that, okay? But the argument for subsidizing or bailing out or otherwise forcing folks to pay more for coal and nuclear is that, well, we need to make sure that we have plants that have their fuel on site so that if it gets very, very cold or someone does something to the fuel distribution system for natural gas, we don't have to worry. Or if somebody destroys the rail system, there's coal on site, there's nuclear on site. So we will have the electricity we need. Now, what's interesting is to make this argument stick with authority, they're proposing to use a wartime emergency authorities, which Pretty interesting. I mean, at some level, we're at war. We were at war, I suppose, in Afghanistan. There's the war on terror, but that's interesting. Uh, generally, these things, these authorities have been used uh, like during the Korean War, as a famous example. Um, and they have been used more recently, so you know, maybe there's something to this. But anyway, that's the argument. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about resiliency to get a better uh, understanding of the things we just covered. Okay, here we are again. All right, so if you go, there's a red line there, and that's, that's, that's a fuel supply line. That could be a, a natural gas line, uh, it could be a, a coal uh, train uh, that delivers coal. Um, I, think, I think that's roughly it. I suppose you could, you could argue that uh, water you know, for hydro would be a fuel supply question. It's a little strange. All right, in any case, you then have the power plant. You have the, the transmission substation, the voltage lines, the big ones, and your power substation, and your first uh, transformer or first setup. That's called the bulk power system, that portion. The portion from that transformer to the home or the factory is called the local distribution system. Now, the first thing to observe is if you want to, if you study um, grid interruptions or failures, it's the local distribution system is where 90% of them occur. Um, and we'll get into some pictures of how that happens. Um, then uh, from the um, power plant to the transformer, 
uh, if you will, the bulk power system, maybe about 10%. And then the fuel supply line, which is the focus of this debate, is less than 1%. Uh, so, in a sense, we have the fuel supply tail wagging the debate of the entire system. Uh, it's not that it is in some consequence, but that's probably not intuitive. Okay? So let's take a look. Here is a study uh, from data that's available from 2012 to 2016. I think it's a little stylized. I, mean, I have not looked at this. It could be that they're, they're, they're straining to make this point and making it all too well. But I think it's probably representative of the, the trends at any given period. Severe weather, which affects both uh, the bulk power system and the local distribution system, 64% uh, of the interruptions during that period. Uh, and then just one hurricane, <laughs> Sandy. How many people remember Sandy? Does anybody remember Hurricane Sandy? Nobody? One hand goes up, two hands go up. Oh well, so much for the news. Okay, so then uh, those those weather events affected both the bulk power system and the local distribution system. They did something on generation inadequacy. You know that somehow the power plant wasn't able to operate either for technical or fuel reasons. Um, no, excuse me, just technical reasons. Uh, then there is the fuel supply emergency. You'll look at that number. 0.0007%. I don't know. They say the weakest form of argumentation is citing numbers, but anyway, that's kind of an interesting number. It's pretty low. Okay, let's take a look at that 90% for a moment. Um, trees, hmm, they fall. This has happened on my street twice. Um, cut so. Does anybody know what cutso is? It's a wet vegetation. It grows in northern Virginia like, well, weeds. You get enough of it on that line, brings the, brings the line down. Uh, ice storms and equipment failures. Um, these are my favorites. <laughs> uh, apparently, it's, it's not nothing. I mean, uh, since 87, it's you know, clocking in at about, uh, oh, what is that, 1,100 plus 700, 800, about 2,000 events um, due to these critters. So um, there are problems as well. Um, so what do you do for these kinds of problems? I think uh, the first thing you do, and you've seen this, if you ever see high power lines, they're cleared, right? There's, a, there's an alleyway. And every time there's a really big storm, they make it bigger. And the, the local homeowners get aggravated because they love their trees near them, but they make it bigger. The other thing is you can upgrade your local service. You spend more for your utility bill, but they have more trucks so that the interruption is short. Um, you could have spare transformers. One of the discoveries is that if you, you know, want to be a terrorist, you can get a high-powered rifle, fire at one of these things, watch the oil come out of it, and put it out of commission. Well, to replace it, you have to have a transformer on, on, on ready. Well, we didn't in California. It's quite a while to replace it. You could fix that, you know, have transformer reserves. And then, of course, um, another idea would be, uh, you know, you get your Birkenstocks on and go off the grid. your solar, or your wind, and your battery, and not rely as much on the grid. Uh, yet another idea would be to encourage direct current transmission so that you wouldn't have to worry about the transformer issue. I mean, these things cost money, though. All of them. Okay, what's also interesting if you're trying to, you know, decipher the debate about these things is that people tend to obsess about the kinds of uh, vulnerabilities that they have authority over to correct. So if you talk to someone at the federal um, electrical, um, well, FERC, what's the stand for? Federal uh, Electricity uh, Regulatory. Regulatory Commission. God, thank you. I need 
I told you I wasn't an expert. Okay, it's showing. Well, what do they control? Well, they only control the bulk power system. Well, so when you ask them about what's the problem, well, they'll talk about all the problems about the bulk handling facility. You know, the, the, everything from the power substation back to the power plant. Okay, if you're um, worried about uh, local distribution, well, who are you? You're the state, municipalities, and local utilities. And they'll lecture you till you're blue in the face about that. You'll get notices in the mail. That's what they will talk about. Why? Well, that's all they have authority over. And finally, lest we have any mystery about this, what does the federal government at the Department of Homeland Security and DOE have authority over? Oh, well, not very much. Power inefficiencies, cyber attacks, and fuel interruptions. So when they talk, they talk about those things. It's just natural. They don't talk about the other things because, well, they don't have authority over those things. Michelin guides at the debate. When people speak and what they focus on. You might ask, well, where do you work? Okay. All right. You've gotten your primer. Are there any questions, given that we went through a lot of stuff? Silence. Oh, there we go. I have some comments, but the question that comes to mind is, uh, Enriching uranium. Can you explain that process? If my understanding is that you actually add energy to the uranium, in other words, the, high, the energy state of the electrons? No. 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 Okay. And, and I will show immense self discipline and blow you off. And the reason I will is because it, it's not central to, the, to this presentation. But essentially, now that I've blown you off, I feel so bad. The answer is, you use energy to isotopically isolate the most fizzle-prone isotopes. And uh, believe me, uh, there's a net production of ele electrical power as a result that far exceeds what you put into the process, dramatically. And one comment or question uh, as far as the future of the grid, yeah. uh, the smart grid, yeah, Elon Musk did his PhD on uh, Ultra capacitors. Yes. The idea is in the future, you know, cars have ultra capacitors very quickly can store and right. discharge energy. The, the car is connected to the grid. Yes. Peak demand. Right. They're plugged in. Well, we'll get to that in a moment, but as Cambridge Energy would say, we're not sure if our cars will plug into our houses or our houses will plug into our cars. So there was another question back there. Yes. Uh, what extent was the problem in Puerto Rico? Uh, well, the, almost everything got flattened, didn't it? Uh, so, you know, part of it is that when power lines are not buried, they can get knocked over. So part of it had to do with, um, and, and we see this here in Arlington. I mean, as I say, I've had two outages uh, in the last 10 years, and both times it was the power poles got knocked over. If the lines were buried, you know, that'd be something different. But the vulnerability of that system, I haven't studied, but I'm sure that lots of things got knocked out. Uh, and it wasn't just any single thing. I mean, that, that storm was brutal. I mean, they're still trying to figure out how to patch that island back together. Yeah. And it's been a while. Even electrically, they're still figuring that out. So, there was one other question. No? Okay, let's keep going. All right. The first thing you want to know uh, about uh, the electrical and gas distribution systems, uh, first in the United States and then more generally comparatively, is they can be, and in our case are, very complex and international. You'll notice that these lines uh, include a variety of different uh, voltage uh, ratings, and they go into Canada, out of Canada, into Mexico, out of Mexico. They go west, east, north, south. And there's a lot of them. There's direct current and there's alternating current. This is robust. Uh, the same thing is true of the gas line system, which is both international and complex. And it allows the use of gas for a lot of electrical applications as well as processing heat and home heating. 
This is a very robust system. I think Europe certainly qualifies along the same lines. This is both electrical and gas, and you'll, you'll notice it's a honeycomb. Now, why does that matter? Well, it means that if one part of the grid, whether it's gas distribution or electrical, goes down, you can reroute around it if you know what's going on. The less complex and robust your systems are, uh, you have a failure. Uh, has anybody used the metro recently? You have. Have you ever noticed sometimes you don't go anywhere? You stop? Now, do you know how many tracks there are in the system? Oh, like very. next to each other? Great parallel. Well, in any one direction, how many are there? One. That's why you're stopped. They can't pull something aside. They can't reroute. That's why you want a complex system. When you go to New York and Boston, they have more than one track in any given direction. Roughly, that's the same point that I'm trying to make here. Yeah? Okay. Now, you compare that to the Middle East, <laughs> it doesn't look so complex. Uh, and th these are plans. Uh, this is work in progress. Uh, partly, uh, one of the advantages of being friendly is if you can get along with your neighbors, you can trust them with an electrical or gas line. If you're not, you're kind of loath to lace that pipe or that, that, that uh, line over to your neighbor. And a lot of these gas lines stop at the borders of some of these countries. And they have to politically talk to one another to get to the point where they trust one another to do it. This is primitive. A little better, but what if I was to tell you uh, it is very difficult to get oil out of this region unless it goes through the Strait of Hormuz, which is something the Iranians recently threatened to shut down. You might want to fix that, but then you'd have to have all of the Gulf uh, uh, GCC countries getting along. Oh, well, that's a problem. Anyway, this could be better. Let's just leave it at that. All right, when you get to East Asia, I think you, you get the classic example of really, really bad. Uh, there's a lot of electricity, and so that's good. But uh, we, the famous picture of uh, Korea, I mean, how many people have seen that before? Show of hands. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, everybody likes to show off and put that one up. The frequency in the south is different than the frequency in the north. So you can't move electricity from the south into the north very easily. But more important, there just isn't much going on in the way of electrical generation and use in the north. That looks terrible, and you think, oh, well, it's just North Korea. You know, it's a primitive place, blah, blah, blah. Well, what if I was to tell you that in Japan, you'll notice that there's a line through the country right in the middle there on that map? That line is a delineator of the frequencies in the uh, east and the frequencies uh, in the west. They're different, kind of like North and South Korea. As a result, you can only move one gigawatt of electricity roughly from the north to the south and from the south to the north. If you want to know why the crisis of Fukushima was even worse than it had to be, this is part of the reason. China, well, they're trying to fix things. You notice the, the red lines. Uh, those are direct current uh, transmission, high voltage current lines. They aren't built yet, but they're planning to try to move things from west to east. Mostly their electrical grid system is north to south and it's all on the coast. So they're investing, you know, everyone debates about, well, what the future, you know, electricity will be in, in uh, China, will it, how much will be nuclear, how much will be coal, how much will be natural gas and renewables. Well, that's all interesting, but what they're investing in far more than any of those things is trying to figure out how to sort the grid out. And that is the big dollar figure in their five year. This is a uh, fanciful uh, something that uh, uh, the richest man in Japan, um, 
throughout at a, at a meeting in Shanghai several years ago. Um, and uh, he has a company called Bloom Energy, and they, they would like to build a super grid. Uh, and I said, yeah, but nobody gets along with one another. He said, well, you know, at some point, perhaps South Korea will throw the line down into Japan. And when it does, everyone will go, wow, that saved a lot of money. Uh, and you're making a lot of money. And then everyone will start racing to figure out other places to connect countries together. Right now, none of the countries are connected. That could change. I think it would probably require one thing, though. Everyone would have to forget all of the history and why they hate one another. Could take a couple of weeks. But when it happens, lots of wealth building will occur. OK, what else? is going on in the way of trends. Well, this is a big trend, not only in, in our country, but around the world. Natural gas is being substituted for coal and nuclear. Here is an energy department uh, graph showing, uh, on the left-hand side, the dip in coal usage. And uh, the stable uh, and flat uh, production of nuclear power. Uh, what's interesting here is the third line, uh, which is very faint, but you can see it on the, the graph to the right, and that's natural gas, which now has finally exceeded the amount of coal generated electricity. This has to do with the shale re revolution and the exploitation of conventional gas, and it is just a lot cheaper to build new gas-fired plants than it is to build coal-fired plants that, forget the, the carbon for the moment, are just clean enough with regard to all the other pollutants. Um, now, this has caught out, I think, uh, some of the, uh, the rural electrics invested in cleaning up their coal. Part of the problem is they're being penalized for their investments, and that's sort of part of the political problem we face. But all things aside, natural gas is on the rise, coal is on decline. The other thing that's sort of interesting, uh, but it's not yet you know, a massive event, is you'll notice wind and solar are increasing. Um, expect that line to continue to climb. And the reason why isn't because of subsidies, which are declining, oddly enough. It's because the cost of producing solar and wind is going down. There are limits, however, and we'll get into that now, or pretty soon, having to do with storage can't store it in a minute, you got to throw it away. You can only use electricity when it's needed. Uh, if you produce it when it's not needed, you got to store it, and that costs money. Okay, uh, just a kind of standard uh, map of natural gas resources. Uh, the orange is currently in play. Uh, the black line things are currently in play as well, as is the blue. And then there's prospect and, and basin, and some of it is shale and some of it isn't. Um, most of it will be shale, and it is affordable. The techniques for extracting the shale are getting better and better. Think Moore's Law. The price of extracting a million BTU of natural gas is falling exponentially because of the different techniques that they keep devising. I won't get into them unless there's a Q&A on that. Now, this has changed the market. Uh, it used to be, back even as recently as the early 2000s, you could get real spikes. When I put my water, well, my, my furnace in, it was $18 per million BTU. It's now uh, roughly three bucks. And you'll notice that it's been that way now for, you know, nigh... Well, it's been a little five now since about eight years. The spikes are getting less high, the duration of the low price longer. Here's part of the reason why this is of interest beyond the United States. Up and I had a class, I used to teach here when it wasn't accredited, which was a lot of fun. Uh, almost anyone could walk in the door and become a student, and I mean, Almost anybody did. So it was exciting. You never knew who was in the class. But 
back then, I asked my students, I said, could you please graph where natural gas is being prospected for, for the purposes of only finding natural gas? Uh, and, and the market with a big red mark. You know how many red marks there were back then? Zero. Why? The natural gas that we had found was a knock-on effect of whatever oil prospecting there was. And in fact, back then, the price of natural gas was tied to the price of oil. It isn't anymore, and yes, they do now look for natural gas, even if they don't think they're going to find any oil. When they began to do that, this is the kind of thing that they found. Those big red, those big blue circles indicate the kinds of reserves uh, the world is discovering, and they're enormous. They're, well, as our president would say, huge. Right? They're even being found in places that are nasty and usually needy, and, you know, having difficulty getting along. Uh, the Israelis, the Lebanese, the Egyptians are all, and Cyprus and Greece and even Turkey, they're all finding things offshore that are now finally being tapped. Even. I mean, before it was thought too expensive. The Israelis are planning to export most of the natural gas to Europe. This is like wild. And the size of these fields are enormous as well. They're very, very large. Our standby. You know, uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, they, there's still, there's still more natural gas there, folks. Lots of it. Iran. Uh, I once talked with an Iranian who was a big proponent of nuclear power, and I said, "Well, do you really need it?" Um, he said, "Well, the way we burn our energy and our, our natural gas, of course we need it." He said, of course, if we closed the windows or put a price on this stuff, we wouldn't need any nuclear power for 100 years. They have a lot of natural gas. Almost all of their electricity is uh, based on natural gas. Almost all of it. Okay, next trend. Because of the, this, we're seeing uh, a lot of uh, coal plants being shut down and being replaced with, with gas, natural gas. This is a, a, a chart uh, showing, on the one hand, uh, coal-fired generation retirements through 2016. That map still looks really intense if you project forward. Uh, on the other hand, the addition of natural gas is in the fired plants is on the next map. And there's a pretty solid correlation between the two maps. If it was just us, I think it would be far by way enough to pay attention to, but it's not. Beijing wants to shut down its coal power plants. The big question is, will they? Stay tuned. Others want to make this conversion, and they're big markets. This one is a big question mark. Um, I once had a gathering with Chinese and uh, we were talking about, well, maybe we can't prevent carbon pollution, if that's what you're worried about, but how about just other pollutants from coal? And, and, and we were sitting there saying, well, what you need are scrubbers. And, uh, Chinese nodded very politely. He said, well, you know, this would cost, you know, like for a gigawatt, maybe a billion dollars for each. And they nodded very politely. And finally, after all of the Americans were done explaining how to suck eggs to the Chinese, one of the Chinese technicians raised his hand and said, you know, we do have the scrubbers. We just don't run them because it costs more money. So, you know, how this works, I don't know. It also goes to the question of, will they make the coal retirements quickly because it puts people out of work? The gas plants don't require as many people to run operate and maintain. Okay, here is a chart that was shown at the American Enterprise Institute to, I think three days before um, Fukushima. It's kind of interesting. And it was shown by the uh, John Rowe, who runs the largest merchant 
nuclear utility in the world. That means he raises his money by going to banks, not going to Washington or the state capitol. Pretty impressive guy, nuclear guy, by the way. And he put this chart up. It's called the, are you ready for this? The McKenzie Greenhouse Gas Cost Abatement Curve. Now, there are other models, but this one was popular at the time, and they've since come out with a revised one, which they will not share with the public because it's embarrassingly accurate, they think, with regard to things the utility should do that the utilities don't want the public to know about. So if you want to get paranoid, any libertarians out there, this chart's for you. Okay, what is this chart about? If I came to you, let's say you're really concerned about global warming and the amount of greenhouse gas. And I said, you know, I have a way to reduce, actually eliminate greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it involves um, harnessing two sources, fusion, cold fusion, and uh, the energy from moonbeams. Now, uh, you might ask, well, when will you have that ready? I said, oh, well, it might take two or three hundred years. And you might ask, well, how much would that cost? Oh, I don't know, uh, several quadrillion dollars. Now, if somebody came to you and said, well, you know, I have a way to cut your current admissions by 50% and you'll make money and I can do it in 18 months. Which two things, you know, you have those two choices, which one do you choose? 18 months. 18 months. There's a time value to money. So. What this chart does is it says for an investment, how much carbon or greenhouse gas, in this case it's actually carbon, can you reduce? And what you want to do is not only reduce it for the least amount of money, but in the least amount of time. And this factors it in. Now there's some things that are, that are stunningly affected that you actually uh, can make money at right away. You don't have to invest. Any guesses as to what that is? It's, it's so criminally simple, it's, it's hilarious. Turn off the lights! I'm always doing that around my house. I, I was brought up in a depression household. My parents constantly turned off the lights in the windows. So that's conveyed by the genes. So I turn the lights on. If you have efficiencies, etc., some of the investments actually get a return on investment so quickly that it pays to do it. When you get to some of the things above the line, you have to pay money in a way where you don't get an immediate return on investment. Number 11, according to Exelon, using this curve, is building a nuclear power plant. Number 11. Now, um, what's interesting is there's another group that uses this curve. It isn't Exelon. It's Greenpeace. I think that's kind of interesting. They both use the same curve. So, um, food for thought. You may want to do everything prior to things that are very tall on the right-hand side of that graph. You may want to do the easy stuff that makes money or that doesn't cost much first. That would be the logic. Okay, that gets to why right now people are writing pieces saying, you know, nuclear power's future may not be a given. Part of the reason has to do with the capital cost. A capital cost is a fancy word for how much does it cost to construct one of these things. Um, now, um, there's something called overnight costs, and that's a way of calculating what it would cost to build something if it, you could do it overnight. Pretty logical. Well, why would you do that? Well, you, by the way, you can't do that. It's, it's a myth. But the reason you might want to do that is because there are, let's take, take the example of a nuclear power plant. Some of them take almost 10 years or more to build. There are carrying costs, interest costs. Think student loans. You've got to pay the, the, the interest on those loans. Overnight costs, you get to exclude that. Now, one of the advantages of looking at overnight costs is it, if it isn't favorable then, it doesn't get better when you include the carrying costs. It gets worse. 
And what you want to see with a mature technology is the overnight costs for a given amount of electricity going down over time because, well, you've learned. You have a learning curve. You learn how to do the plant so that you get it done more quickly. And more important, you learn how to reduce costs for the parts and putting them together. Um, what's happened is the opposite. As one fellow put it uh, with this chart on the other side, other side um, there isn't a learning curve when it comes to large nuclear power plants. There's a forgetting curve. And what, what that means is, despite all the experience, the costs of these units keep going up. That suggests you're going to need some new way, new technology, new way to do things. Here is uh, another way to look at costs, which is not overnight. What you do is you take the carrying costs, the capital costs, the operating costs, the decommissioning costs. You get one big fat figure. Then you divide it by the number of kilowatt or gigawatts, depending, that you've generated over the lifetime, and you get a levelized cost uh, per unit of electricity. And what's interesting here is that um, some of the cheapest things uh, are, are intermittent, and I think that's a little unfair, and the reason I say I think it actually is major unfair because you, they don't include the cost of storage. And if you can't store this electricity, it's not terribly interesting. We'll get back to that later. But more to the point is when you compare nuclear, uh, which is that red line, if you will, that circled red line, it's pretty far over to the right. It's pretty expensive. In fact, it competes with peaking power, which is ghastly, no pun intended. Expensive. It shouldn't. It needs to go to the left. Um, some of the, the cheaper stuff is gas combined cycle at the bottom. Uh, the wind, again, I think that's funny because you have to have storage included in that, and they don't on this. Um, but we'll get back to that. There, there's some advances here. But you can see that nuclear is not you know, way ahead of everybody. It's kind of, at the, at the right-hand side, it can be super expensive. <laughs> so that's what it's competing with. Now, some of the, the less expensive nuclear on the left-hand side has to do with existing plants whose capital costs have been totally taken care of, so there are no carrying costs. Uh, there are also plants that work well. So there's quite a range. Now, this one's sort of interesting. This is a, a chart that was done again before Fukushima. If anything, it's gotten worse since Fukushima. But it shows what the cost uh, of an AP-1000, which is the, the, the only reactor currently being built in the United States, would cost in cents per kilowatt hour. And these are levelized costs. And you'll notice that it is the, it is the gray one, and it is the most expensive, uh, at least for the Californians. So this also ex helps explain why the only plant being built now is one that has massive loan guarantees from the Department of Energy and has already run way over budget and way beyond its construction projection. Uh, this is a problem for the future of nuclear power as it's configured with large plants like that, at least in the United States and advanced economies. Now, the same plan has been built in China. We do not really have a clear idea of what the costs are for that economy. Clearly, uh, they will tell you it costs a fraction. And at some level, I'm prepared to believe it did. Whether we're comparing the same thing or not is another question. And how you work an economy that's a command economy at pricing and ours versus, let's say, comparing costs between us and European Union or Japan. Much easier in those latter two cases than it is with the demand So, a little tricky. Okay, this is interesting. Um, what the uh, head of Exelon said is, I will build a nuclear power plant when, this was in 2011, so it's seven years ago, when the price of natural gas stabilizes above $8, uh, per million BTU, and the carbon prices are above 25. Well, the carbon prices, a lot of the markets just collapsed to paying anything. Uh, they never 
got above 35 for more than you know a year or two. Um, we went through the natural gas price; it's roughly around three dollars. And even in you know very uh, bad markets right now, uh, the range is between you know six and eight. Uh, so, you know, maybe in some markets it would make sense. But, of course, he said both would have to be the case. Yeah? When you talk about carbon prices, are you talking about carbon trading? Yes, that's it. And as I say, this was seven years ago, so presumably there's some inflation, blah, blah, blah. You know, the number would be a little higher. Um, so, one of the things that, you know, President Trump and, and uh, Secretary of Energy Perry is concerned about is, well, Nuclear power retirements are going to be coming on heavy and strong. And the reason why is the operating costs uh, are very high compared to natural gas. And so, you know, utilities are looking at this and saying, you know, we'd save money just turning these things off. And here's a, you know, planned retirements through 2025. Quite a lot of them. This one's a more disturbing chart. Um, this is a projection of which power plants, nuclear power plants, will make money and which ones will lose money. You'll notice the ones that will lose money much higher than the ones that are making money. Uh, so it isn't just the United States. Uh, in Europe, the um, decommissionings are, on, uh, are more than the construction as well, significant. Um, and that trend will continue. Um, it's also happening in Japan. Uh, the number of reactors in South Korea uh, also is projected to decline. That, I think, is open to question. Uh, right now, they have 24. They want to say that uh, by the mid 30s, they'll be down to 14. We'll see. That may not happen because that's political in many respects. Whereas the number of active plants in Japan is now about eight and they used to have 48, and the odds of them getting very many more, uh, or getting back, I should say, getting back to 48, uh, not possible. So uh, there is no projection of any additional construction beyond the, I think there's one plant in Oma that's being worked on. Um, that may be it. Uh, even in China, the projections are coming down. This is uh, based on the Nuclear Energy uh, uh, Institute, uh, no, Nuclear Engineering International, I'm sorry, um, magazine. Um, one of their lead economists explained that the projection for 2020, which is 24 months from now, will not be met, and the 2030 projection of 150 gigawatts you know, is off by 30%. It'll be more like 100. Yeah. So things are slowing down. Um, in the Middle East, we had a study done by uh, some economists in uh, the UAE, United Arab Emirates. This is an interesting uh, chart because the bottom two things are for peak power, diesel and gas. Nuclear comes in third. Onshore wind, uh, where you can get it, uh, I think that's not everywhere, um, is pretty expensive. But then you keep going up, and there are a lot of options that make more sense economically. Um, now, I thought I had more charts than that uh, for the Middle East. I think they come later. They come later. Okay. Smart grid. Someone, someone said smart. Okay. Smart of the dimension. Yes. What is that? Essentially, uh, a smart grid allows you to, to sense what demand is better and switch and rotate to consumers from generators what they need and what's cheapest. You mentioned uh, the car and its battery being thrown onto the grid. It's represented here. Um, but you have to know that that car is plugged in. You have to know what is out there to throw on the grid if it's intermittent, if it's photovoltaic or it's renewable, wind or hydro. So you need metering figuring in, informing the management of the grid more and more. The grid does it now. You can spend more money to make it do it better. So it isn't like the grid is stupid now. It just can get smarter. It costs money. You mentioned supercapacitors. Uh, 
it's a kind of battery. You can you can put a, a certain amount of uh, electricity into a supercapacitor, and it will emit it very quickly. Batteries, uh, we have seen. Uh, Mr. Musk is a big fan of using lithium. Um, smart monitor, high voltage direct current, usually is used with intermittence for a variety of reasons. You can, it's cheaper to move the stuff long distances. This is another representation of the, the traditional central generated grid distributed uh, model that we currently have versus the future, some people argue, where uh, you will just pull from various renewables as you need it. Um, and uh, there's not even a, an image of a grid there. I think that latter thing is fanciful because the grid has a lot of, of uh, money in it, it works. What's more likely, if there's going to be a move to uh, intermittence, is that you may use the grid as a backup. And what you would need is battery storage. Uh, and there are various ways. You can pump water up, uh, which is very expensive. Uh, lithium, you can use. It's not cheap. They're talking about flow batteries that may be affordable. Uh, this gives you some idea of the, the countries most interested in smart grid investments before Fukushima. You'll notice China was ahead even then. I think if you took a look at this chart today, uh, China would be way ahead compared to the United States. Um, now, there is this problem of intermittency. Remember our peak and uh, base load chart? In the middle of the day, when it's hot, you're using the most electricity. Now, if you are um, putting out solar power in the middle of the day, what you're going to do is get on the grid and supply all that demand. If you take a look, what that means is that the baseload generators, the nuclear power plants, the big gas plants, the big hydro plants, they're not going to be able to compete during the day with the solar. And this is called the duct curve. This is a problem. To solve it, you need to flatten the curve out by having storage so you don't use you know, your solar just because you have it available. You use your solar when it is most efficacious to do so. You store it, maybe you use it in the evening. We're not there yet. Uh, this is you know, the kind of battery technology we have. It's not that cheap, but it's getting cheaper. As it comes down, this problem will get mitigated very significantly. Now, it's interesting. Already, battery storage is being used, but in the most odd fashion. This is in California. Everyone said, oh, well, the batteries will help wind and solar become economic. It may in the long run. But uh, in the short run, guess who's using it? Gas-fired plants. This is way not intuitive. Well, why are they using it? They don't have to run, remember I said spinning reserve plants for peepers? They just turn the plant off. They run it to top off the batteries. Once the batteries are topped off, they turn the plant off. They, it doesn't pollute as much, they save money. And then when they have to compete and bid to supply a demand, they just use the battery power for the first 30 minutes. And they use that 30 minutes to turn the rest of the gas plant on. This makes the gas plant far less polluting, cheaper, and far more competitive. So some of the battery technology is working in ways not anticipated. OK, um, this is the Middle East. They have a lot of sun. They have some wind. Uh, the price, to give you some idea, the price of nuclear electricity levelized in the Middle East, according to their analysts there, is about 11 cents. Uh, the latest ED, uh, bid uh, for Saudi Arabia uh, was as low as 1.7 cents. That's an order of magnitude less. Now, admittedly, it's intermittent. But that gets to something else. Uh, do we have a picture? Oh, we don't have a picture of concentrated solar. That's bad. We're going to fix that. There's uh, any of you ever go to California? If you do, go out in the desert and you'll see an amazing structure that the DOE has built. 
lots of mirrors, and they concentrate the reflection onto something that has a big tank of sodium. That's salt. It gets hot. It stays hot. It produces heat at night and allows for the generation of steam and electricity. They call it concentrated solar power. Well, concentrated solar power in UAE just came in on a bid for less than eight cents per installed kilowatt hour, which means it's less than nuclear and it works in concert with the regular solar 24 7. Yeah. I, I'm trying to restrain myself. I, I, I would, would you consider, or, or have you considered using the words politically preferred electrons and non politically preferred electrons? No, I'll tell you and, why. And, no, I'll and, tell, and, yeah, and this is the what? Middle East, this is not the United States. In other words, we don't have that kind of solar pattern. They do. And they're not doing it because it's preferred. They're doing it because it's cheaper. To give you some idea, the UAE just decided to stop building any more nuclear plants. They're building concentrated solar plants, gas-fired systems, and the like, because the numbers there are clear. They're not as clear when you go above the equator. But I'm telling you, in this market, it's not a question of Birkenstock versus wingtip. It's just a balance sheet. You know, I, I'm I struggle with what you're the way you're describing I mean, the concentrated solar. I mean, I, I've been there at the older ones. I haven't been to the most well. The older ones ones. are but, much more expensive. But still, they they have the same basic. You say it generates power afterwards. It doesn't generate power. The idea is you heat lots right. of oil. And then you can take, you can use the hot oil to Well, that's what I said, time. sodium in this case. Yeah. Well, oil, it means right. just okay. the key is you have to find some way to store the thermal energy. Right. And that's what you generate power right. from. Well, so but we're in yeah. agreement on that. I, I, didn't, I don't think I described it in any other way. Yeah. Okay. But it, it, it isn't just the daily cycle. I mean, it has, uh, I mean, there, well, you have the annual cycle and it's way more, I mean, you're, nobody is doing, I, I mean, no. I, I guess that's the well, question. Well, maybe you need to ask a question. Yeah, right. I, mean, I, mean, I, I mean, what I, I sense I, is I turn angst, in, but, but I don't sense I, a question. I, do you believe that there is a place in the world where they're building large-scale solar, where they're actually doing it, yeah. where the people building it aren't doing it because they're so Yes, and I, the picture I wanted to show you were two projects, one in Saudi Arabia and one in, that are enormous. And they're not doing it for show. They're doing it because of the balance sheet. And the reason they're doing the photovoltaic with the concentrated solar is to get the intermittency problem over with. And they, I don't know that they're going to get there, but they're tying it also with natural gas plants. Okay. There's, there, there are two or three studies you can go up that, that I commissioned that were done by people in the region trying to nut out what the, what the smart investments were. And mostly it was grid, natural gas, solar, and concentrated solar. Those were your best bets there. Now you'll take a look. You don't have anywhere in the United States, but maybe some portions of the year in Arizona that look like that first chart to the left and the right. So it doesn't work everywhere. This, the technology, though, is changing. In other words, the plant that we built out in California, it would not be able to compete at all. It's way too expensive. This stuff's being made by the Spaniards. It's newer. The technology is more economical. All right. Um, in any case, uh, we're just about done. Um, one of the other questions is how much electricity we need. It's pretty clear that as you develop, you use more electricity. But what's interesting is in the developed economies, the amount of electricity for a given amount of GDP is declining. I can't imagine that that alone will allow you to get away with not increasing the amount of electricity. But this trend is something that's worth 
looking at. The other thing is the projections of both global warming and electrical demand are very heavily dependent on one other thing that we don't ever question, and that's demographics. Uh, the models almost always assume uh, rates of fertility that probably are not going to be for real. And the reason why is simple. As education levels go up, fertility goes down. And the education levels internationally are going up. The models don't reflect that yet. Uh, here's just a, a rather fun chart um, showing the all the different generation of electricity and, and, and all kinds of uh, energy uh, that goes into uh, transport and the rest. What's interesting is um, easily, uh, you know, what is the number at the top there? I have a hard time reading it, but it's certainly, I think the bottom is about a third of, of what it is we, we use for energy results in things like transport, energy, forward movement, the rest. The rest is literally goes up into the sky. Uh, and the question is, can you change that? And the answer is yes. It's expensive. It takes time. But that actually is changing. Last but not least, my favorite, um, subsidies. One of the reasons this field is so difficult uh, to get good knowledge and, and also to be able to talk with one another about is that it's very hard to know what things cost. And the reason why is each kind of energy has subsidies. And there, there are different kinds of subsidies. And trying to figure out what those subsidies are worth make it very difficult to do comparisons. Um, I understand that the, the one energy economist I talked with said there may be 50 to 100 energy subsidy economists full time in the world. That's not going to make this debate about what to do any easier because. A lot of this hides what things actually cost. And it, it, it makes it difficult to know what oil, gas, nuclear, wind, solar, etc. cost. You have to factor and peel that stuff out to try to do comparisons. It's a real challenge. Uh, you know, these are attempts. You know, but what that's worth, I always say start off and improve. This area needs probably more work than anything having to do with research and development, understanding how subsidies. So, that's a lot. I am done. Questions? Yes? Yeah, thank you so much for your interesting and thoughtful presentation. Uh, when it comes to energy, the most common questions I like to raise is what, what is the outlook for the price of oil? What is what? The outlook for the price of oil. The, what is the? The outlook. Outlook? Outlook. Outlook, outlook for the outlook price of oil. The, the forecast for the price, for the price of oil. If, which, I, if I knew that, I wouldn't be here. Uh, because uh, a lot of it depends on, yeah. you hear about the Middle East instability, which whenever there's a flare-up in, in, uh, in Syria, in Gaza Strait, yeah. and so on. But in truth, these, these countries in the Middle East, the only, oil, olive oil, the only oil they have is olive oil. They don't have any really petroleum, you know, really. They're not producing any petroleum, but yet uh -huh. there's due, due well, to... Well, certainly concern. in the Gulf they do. In the Gulf they have oil. The Gulf. Yeah. They have oil. I mean, you wouldn't say Iran doesn't have oil or Iraq doesn't well, have oil. There's no oil in Lebanon or, you know, or Well, in a lot of places in the Middle East, East, you're right, they don't. Okay, well, so. Turkey, they don't have oil. No, they don't. But they have, they have pipelines or anything. The, the question about what, what the price of oil is is a little bit like asking uh, any commodity. Uh, first, there are premiums placed on it politically. Why folks at this institute should be interested in energy economics has to do directly with well, we have to do X because the price of oil will go off the map and ruin our economy. It is still possible to get the price of oil so high that the transport sector in particular gets hit so hard that your economy falters. Even though we have our own, the prices are fungible. So if the price goes up in the Middle East, it goes up in the United States too, even though we have our own. So it's an important question. I mean, the answer, I mean, turns on so many variables, I mean, I don't know, including international crises, supply. Frequently, just a storm can knock out enough supply. Investment cycles and transport and all that can get out of sync. Generally, though, the market system for oil and even natural gas works pretty well 
compared to the way it did, let's say, 20 years ago. The markets are becoming bigger. There are alter more alternatives. And so a crisis here, a crisis there, doesn't doom the whole system as much. It's not as fragile as it used to be. The other big question is, you know, will the consumption of oil continue to rise at a given rate? This is not so clear. So I, I, I've not answered your question. I apologize, but it's the best I can do. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you. My name is Elena in Bosnia. Um, I'm an intern with Harvey Day Diamond for International Peace. And I have two questions. The yeah. first one is, uh, what do you think about um, the possibilities of small modular reactors? They are... Um, small? Potentially, yeah. Well, that, that they, are, they are small. They potentially can uh, power microgrids, and also yes. they can be produced in factories that... Well, they can do all sorts of things, and, and uh, particularly because they haven't built a new one yet. We know what small reactors used to be like because we had small reactors before we had large ones. One of the big hurdles they have to overcome is that forgetting curve. If they can't beat the forgetting curve, they're in trouble. And the reason they're in trouble is they don't produce much electricity. One of the reasons the reactors got larger and larger and larger was the demand for uh, making the economy of scale work in the favor of the plant. It's kind of like, you notice airplanes get bigger and they put more seats in? It's the same principle. So now you're going in the opposite direction. And the number of dollars to produce a certain number of kilowatt hours actually is going up. And then you say, well, we'll make so many of them, we'll bring the costs down. So that's, that's what this is about, a war between going against the economies of scale and, and hoping that you can get the numbers of, in production and the learning curve to, to be normal with a, a technology such as they have. Jury's out. I mean, I, I, I think uh, the people that are most interested in investing in this tend not to be banks. I haven't seen banks invest in this. And that, that tells you something. Whereas they do invest in these other technologies, including the natural gas and the solar and the batteries. And I don't think that's just preference. They're betting that they can get a return on investment. And that's the reason why the government is so heavily involved in sustaining those programs, because they cannot get capital for people to do the calculations for themselves with their money, private money. Uh, and uh, my second question um, was, um, so if you compare um, nuclear energy in general yes. to um, natural gas, because it, it's like now it's main competitor because it has like 40% uh, less um, carbon emissions than um, oil and like Coal yep. and um, still, what when you compare um, their emissions for life cycle, gas gives like almost 500 tons for a kilowatt hour, versus nuclear has like only 30 tons. You have to put a value on that. One of the problems that you have is um, you and I may no. I always like to say I favor the lunar power. I think it would be neat if we made our electricity out of Moonbeams. I mean, partly because, um, I'll make this up, this is sarcastic, partly because, well, all those moonbeams are being wasted. It seems a shame. You know, we could, we could capture that. That might be worth something. No one is likely to invest in my proposition because the value that I see in capturing that inefficiency and eliminating it isn't of interest to people like mine. And I think the problem that nuclear power faces is, yes, it can have less carbon emissions. We have not established a carbon market. We don't tax carbon. If you did, you could perhaps see how that would play out. And it may very well be that if you tax carbon enough, as, as the uh, fellow from Exelon pointed out, if you, if you got it above $25 a ton, and you have high natural gas prices above $8 and 19 and 2011 dollars per million BTU, it would make sense. Assuming 
the cost of the reactor didn't go any higher than it did three days before Fukushima. If it did, then the numbers would go up again. You'd have to adjust. But those are the things you're dealing with. If you don't have a carbon market, you're really gesturing to yourself in the sense that you don't have a market value placed on that. It, it, it's like my preference, or as this fellow said, is the preference for different kinds of electrons. It's not economics, it's personal preference. You, you, it doesn't become economic until you put a price on it, I guess is the point. And it's frustrating, but that's, that's what you have to do. Does that help? Yeah, it does, but um, it's strange that um, we absolutely exclude the consequences. Well, I'll give you an example. We don't internalize the costs of being in the Middle East and the price of gasoline or oil to the fullest extent of the externality of having projection uh, of military force into that region. I mean, it can be argued that, well, we need to tax it more. So some of this is baked in the cake of each one of these things. I mean, you could argue that in the case of uh, solar, if it uses silicone, there's a certain amount of silicone pollution that needs to be dialed into the price. Or you could say, no, no, it has certain value because it doesn't have carbon, it should be subsidized. Okay, but you've got to get agreement, and that's a political agreement. Otherwise, you have to rely on a market, and you have to have, have to marketize that cost. And it hasn't, so you're stuck. Yes? Yeah. Um, so I have a question on natural gas pricing. Yeah. Um, so obviously in the U.S., the country obviously is like not thing to the oil. Um, we've kind of developed that old method of uh, keeping natural gas prices between the oil. But I'm interested in your thoughts on like, the LNG markets. Yes. The price a lot more than that, especially when you're putting transport costs into like, these cases sure. and stuff. Uh, like, I've heard of uh, Tokyo or Seoul and Shanghai trying to deal with Henry Hub style. Uh, well, they, they, you raise a good point, which is the hope was, in the old days, you simply pegged the price of natural gas to what a barrel of oil costs, and they, there was a formula, and they still do this, unfortunately, in uh, southern Europe. The contracts need to get rid of, I think. But they will. If you had Singapore or some other location as a hub, get lots of liquefied natural gas. The argument would be is you get economies of scale and you might be able to drive the price down. Uh, because each one of these countries doesn't get along in East Asia, they don't have that hub yet. Which is kind of crazy when you look at how much they consume. The Japanese, the Koreans, and the Chinese are the biggest consumers and together they're an enormous part of the market. So you'd think they'd be thinking about forgetting a little bit of their history and getting along. But much like Pakistan and India, you know, if you look at what would make economic sense, you wouldn't see them operate the way they operate either. It doesn't make any sense. They do remember the history. They don't have the hub. Now, it, the pricing uh, on transport is a big issue. Um, because the price now is ranging around almost, I think, 10 or $11 per million BTU now, the spot price for liquefied natural gas delivered to Tokyo. Well, I mean, just previously, it was as low as a little less than six. The reason it went up, China. It just all of a sudden had a bunch of decisions it made spike. The market will respond, you'll see the price go back down. The one bright point of news is more people are producing more natural gas and more of them are liquefying and sending the stuff out. If there were more hubs, we would see the price advantage of that production sooner. So I'm all for hubs. If we can get them done. Okay.